so welcome back once again. It rained last night, and it kind of seems like it's going to rain again, but for now, it's not. So I figured we could come out here and work on this book a little bit more. I think we are so close to being done, we might actually finish it today. I think that is entirely possible, so... Let's jump back in. If you remember yesterday, Katie actually met and spoke to both Dale and Eric, and they are like her. They do have the, these abilities. And so they're go they've decided they're going to combine forces and see if maybe they can read Mr. C and the other people's minds and find out exactly what's wanted of them. And if if indeed Mr. C is a policeman and is after Katie. So let's jump back into Chapter 14 of The Girl with the Silver Eyes by Willow Davis Roberts. There was no police car in front of the Cedars' apartments this time, but they didn't take any chances. Katie led the way around the back through the alley, and they crept through the shrubbery to look around. A few minutes later, an unfamiliar vehicle pulled up, and when the people got out of it, Katie felt Dale's fingers dig into her arm. His whisper was more felt than heard. It's her. It's the other one, Carrie Lamont. This girl was about their age, and even smaller than Katie. She had dark curly hair and horn-rimmed glasses, as she stood on the sidewalk, waiting for her parents to get out of the car, she seemed to look right at the three children, who were mostly be hid hidden behind the little cedar and bonsai trees. Mrs. Lamont was tall and thin, and would have been pretty if her mouth hadn't looked as if it was always angry. Come on, Katie, they're waiting for us, she said. Mr. Lamont seemed older than his wife, with a fringe of gray hair around a bald spot that he didn't bother to try covering up the way Mr. P. did. He wore work pants and a plaid shirt and heavy boots, and he looked just as cross as Mrs. Lamont. This still sounds crazy to me, he said. He had a very deep voice that rumbled out of his chest. Just because somebody else has a kid as weird as ours, why did we have to come rushing over here in the middle of a baseball game? Why couldn't we have waited until I found out how it came out at least? The group was moving towards the building. Katie and the boys remained frozen in position, and only Carrie seemed aware of them. She didn't say a thing. Katie knew that they ought to try to send her a telepathic message, but between her own fear and excitement, she couldn't think of anything that made sense. I told you, Mrs. Lamont said, in a tone that sounded as if she said it often. Monica called and said that Sandra Casey had found a note with Carrie's name on it, and Dale's, and another boy's. And it's just as I suspected. Those other kids are as peculiar as Carrie is, and now Monica's little girl has disappeared, and we need to find out what's going on. Why? Mr. Lamont asked, kicking at a rock. Is knowing about these kids going to make Carrie any different? They were talking about Carrie as if she weren't there, or as if she were deaf and dumb. Didn't they know that what it made a kid feel like? to know that she was considered a freak even by her own parents? You don't care about anything but your stupid ball games," Mrs. Lamont said. She was close enough now that Katie could see just how pinched her mouth was. You don't care about what's best for your kids. They were still arguing as they entered the building. And then the waiting trio heard Carrie's voice, soft but firm. I forgot my handkerchief. I'll be up in a minute, Mother. Apartment 2A, Mrs. Lamont said, and then the door shut. Carrie didn't go back to the car, though. She stood on the sidewalk, looking at the bushes. Over here, Dale said, in a voice like an old-time stage villain, and Katie came towards them. 
She didn't seem surprised or uneasy as Katie thought she might have been under the circumstances. She looked directly into each of their faces, evaluating the boys and then Katie. Her voice was quiet and melodious. I got your letter. I was trying to figure out how to answer it when your mother called. They found blood in the kitchen, and they were afraid that someone had kidnapped you. Katie lifted the finger with the band-aid. I cut myself on the tuna fish can, that's all. I wasn't kidnapped. They want to arrest me because they think I pushed my grandma down the stairs. Carrie's voice glasses rose, hovered, and then settled on her nose. No, they don't. I mean, maybe somebody does. But that's not why the police are looking for you. Your mother called them because they suspected foul play. She thought maybe something had happened to you. Foul play? That meant somebody had murdered her, right? Katie felt regret if that was what Monica had been worrying about. Poor Monica. You mean they aren't going to arrest me? No. They aren't even looking for you anymore because some Mrs. Jones called the police, so they know you're okay. They know that you've run away instead of being kidnapped. But Mr. C is still here. That's his car over there, Katie said, pointing. And he's been asking questions about me, and he frightened Mrs. M. He wants me for something. He came here to find me. He didn't just happen to move in and bring nothing to cook and nothing to eat but yogurt and peanut butter. Katie was feeling confused, and her words were coming out that way as well, but it didn't bother Carrie. I don't know about him, but if you could all send me messages without speaking to me, we should be able to handle this Mr. C. Dale cleared his throat. I can read minds a little. We were thinking about getting close enough to this Mr. C to see if I could listen in on him. He's up there now, with your mother, Carrie said, and my parents. I think they've called Dale's parents and probably Eric's mother as well. Whatever Mr. C is here for, it concerns all of us, not just Katie. Katie stared at her and then the boys. Was it true? Had she misinterpreted what she had heard? Had Mr. C's questions not been a personal attack on Katie, but an investigation into anyone that was able to do unusual things? I liked Mr. C when he first came, she said. Only, he pretended to be something he wasn't, and he tried to make Mrs. M talk about me, and I was afraid. I'm afraid a lot, Katie told her. It's so hard not to, to remember not to pick up your pencil without touching it when you dropped it and to use your hands to do simple things that you can do without them. Can you read minds? Eric said. No, but I can see in the dark, Carrie told them. My father's always saying, for heaven's sakes, turn on a light in there. How do you expect to find anything in the dark? And I can only move things without touching them if they're small. Me too, Katie said, the electric tingle of excitement in her veins making her tingle everywhere. Only, I'm getting stronger, I think. I moved one of those big rocks around the flower beds. I wonder, if we all work together, could we move something bigger? For a moment, they were all caught up with the idea of forgetting the problem with Mr. C. They looked around for a worthy thing on which to combine their forces. Mrs. K's blue pinto rolled into the parking lot, and Miss K got out. By common consent, the four of them crouched low behind the shrubs. And then, unexpectedly, Mr. P climbed out of the passenger side of the car, struggling with some heavy groceries. I sure appreciate the lift, he told Miss K. Listen, I've got the stuff for a steak dinner here if you want to join me. I don't think so, thanks, Miss K said. She started walking towards the front door of the apartment, almost like she was anxious to get away from him. Dale's freckled face was pressed into the branches. She forgot to set her parking brake, he said. I bet all of us together could move her car. We could roll it right into the next spot. 
No, Katie said. It might roll all the way back out into the street, and I don't want anything to happen to her car. Miss Kay is a very nice person, but he isn't. Maybe we could help him get his groceries inside, Eric said. They look pretty heavy. Maybe he'd appreciate it. Katie didn't stop to think of all the things that Mr. P already blamed her for. She never even thought about any consequences. It was so exciting to be working with the other kids as a team that she didn't try to stop them. What happened next? was as much a surprise to them as it was to Mr. P. Well, almost as much, Katie amended, staring so hard she almost fell through the bushes and out into view. Because the bags that Mr. P had been clutching as if they were heavy had seemingly taken on a life and a mind of their own. They plunged out of his arms and smashed against the front door, which unfortunately was just closing behind Miss P. I think the neighbor is upset about something. Cans rolled everywhere, and a package of rice broke and spilled across the sidewalk. A bottle of wine broke, too, spreading a stain on the cement. A white-wrapped meat package skidded away to the feet of a passing, astonished St. Bernard. Mr. P. yelled in frustrated rage, and the St. Bernard... Taking advantage of the circumstances, picked up the package and trotted off with it. Hey, you mangy mutt, come back with my steak, Mr. P yelled. Nobody was sure who, if anyone in particular, had caused one of Mr. P's cans to fly into the air. They did see it come down, though, and no one was quick enough to change its path. It hit Mr. P right in the middle of his bald spot. Oh, shoot, Dale said, and began to back, back away. Let's get out of here. Eric said something as well, but it was lost in Mr. P's howl of agony. The others were already following Dale's lead, but Katie's shirt caught on a rose bush. As she jerked it free, she heard Miss Kay say, What happened? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to let the door shut in your face. And Mr. P angrily yelled, it's that kid again. She's around here somewhere. Even if the police have given up on her, I haven't. I'll fix her if it's the last thing I ever do. Katie, come on, Eric said, tugging at her arm. Her shirt came free, and Katie ran. Ah, their dogs got out. They didn't rest until they reached the alley where they leaned, panting against the garbage cans. I think, Carrie said, that we overdid it. Yeah, but we proved something, didn't we? If we work together, we're stronger, Dale said. Just think what it would be like if we could all go to the same school. That would probably make it worse, Eric told them. He had hit his hand on something and he wiped the blood off on his pants. I mean, if kids don't like one weird kid, how would they react to four of us? Katie looked around at them, the circle of faces that were all different except for the silver eyes behind thick glasses. I feel better, though, she said, knowing I'm not the only one. And there could be more, right? Maybe we could find more of us if we really tried. Eric decided his cut wasn't worth worrying about, and he stuck his hand in his pocket. What do you suggest, he said, that we run an ad in the paper, call this number if you have silver eyes and paranormal powers? No, but there must be something we can do. I don't want to go back to living the way I did before, feeling all by myself. I wonder, she said, if my mother will like me a bit better now that she knows I'm not the only one. Nobody answered that, and she wondered if the others had the same problems that she did. After a moment of silence, Katie pushed herself away from the can and put as much strength into her voice as she could. I guess, she said, that we had better go see what we can find out about Mr. C. They went back up the stairs quietly, unwilling to meet Mr. P or anyone else. 
Behind the door of the apartment 2A, they could hear voices, lots of them, all talking at once. Of one accord, the other three stepped aside to let Dale close the door. Can you tell anything? Carrie whispered. Dale shook his head. No, I can't pick out Mr. C's thoughts at all. There are too many people, and they're all too emotional. I think it makes it harder. Katie hesitated, swallowed, and then spoke with determination. If it was true that she wasn't wanted by the police, and she had the backing of her new friends, maybe they didn't need to read anyone's mind. Why don't we walk in, she said, touching the door. Maybe they'll just tell us what it's about. And that is what they did. Monica gave a cry of relief and rushed across the room to crush Katie in a tight hug. Where have you been, she said. Why did you run away? I didn't want to go to jail. I didn't hurt Grandma. I didn't, really, and I thought they were going to put me in jail. Monica's eyes filled with tears. We'd never let anyone do that. Never. Nathan appeared behind her. You okay, kid? You're not hurt? I'm all right, Katie said. She saw a blur of faces around the room. Even Mrs. M was there in one of her flowered moo-moos, looking as if her hair had barely survived a hurricane. Are you all mad at me? No, Monica told her. We only called the police because we thought something happened to you. There was blood in the kitchen, and you're not used to cities. Little girls can get into trouble in the cities. So we asked the TV stations to run your picture in case anyone saw you. Oh, Katie, you scared me half to death. Katie looked past her mother to Mr. C, who was running a hand through his hair so it stood up almost as wildly as Mrs. M's. He was asking questions about me. He said that the arm roosters thought I hurt Grandma. I thought he was going to lock me up. Mr. C made a face. I guess I bungled everything. I didn't mean to scare you, Katie. I was asking questions, but not because I wanted to lock you up. I was trying to find the truth so I could protect you. I'm not a policeman. I'm with the Institute of Psychic Phenomenon. Katie blinked. What's that? He looked at her companions and then back to Katie. It's a place where we investigate children like you and teach them. We're all learning together, actually, I guess. I, I need to learn a lot myself about how to handle cases like this without scaring people the way I did you, Katie. Katie wasn't sure that she liked being referred to as a case, and she shifted uneasily. You scared Mrs. M, and that scared me. I thought you were going to lock me up. Mrs. M nodded. Yes, he did. You shouldn't go around scaring people, pretending to be a friend and then being so nosy everyone guesses you aren't what you seem. I didn't tell him anything, Katie. I didn't trust him. Her usually pleasant face was scowling. I still don't. Mr. C spread his hands in a gesture of helplessness. All right, I admit it. I handled this badly. But you see, when there are people particularly children, who have what we call paranormal powers, the ability to do things ordinary people can't. Well, most of them learn very quickly not to let other people know how different they are. They keep it a secret. They hide it. And often, the other people around them, their parents and neighbors who love them, they cover it up too. They're afraid of what'll happen if it gets out that the kids can move things without touching them or create winds or read minds, that sort of thing. Monica had a very peculiar expression on her face. You've been telling us that Katie really can move things with the power of her mind. And these other children, they can do things like that too? Katie saw that the other parents were all wearing similar expressions. Mr. C had been talking to them, but it didn't appear any of them had told him anything about their own kids, even though they had all been disturbed. How did you know anything about me? Katie asked. Mr. C was eager to answer that one. 
One of your teachers read an article I had written for a magazine, Katie, he told her. She wrote to tell me that she thought you might be like the special children that I work with at the Institute. I had a vacation coming, so I went to Delaney to meet you. Only your grandma had died, and you had left town, so I had to settle for talking to people that knew you. Some of them, like the arm Brewsters, were hostile enough to make accusations against you. That's not unusual. Mr. Pollard, right here in this building, has done the same thing. He's afraid of you, and he wants to see you taken away. He had turned so that he was addressing them all, the children, but also the parents. I asked a lot of questions because I had to be sure that Katie was one of the special children. I get a lot of mail about people who are supposed to be able to do things, and frankly, a lot of them are fakes. Some are trying to make money by pretending to be able to talk with people's dead relatives, for instance. It's a field with a lot of charlatans. No one asked what a charlatan was. Katie already knew it was a person that pretended to be something that they weren't, usually to cheat someone. Our school is for children who are actually blessed with powers, Mr. C went on. We want to help them learn how to develop those powers to their best extent. Katie was smart enough to figure out that there could be more of you, the ones here today, all born to mothers that worked with a dangerous drug. Well, all drugs are dangerous, potentially. But this one was so dangerous it was discontinued by the manufacturer when they realized it could do harm to people that handle it. Sort of like being around when an atomic bomb goes off. Mr. C. took a deep breath. The drug didn't necessarily cause trouble right then, but tests, even ten years ago, showed that its use could have serious consequences later, just the way it has with these children. But in this case, it wasn't bad. The four of you have powers that the rest of us don't, powers that could be valuable to the human race. We at the Institute want to know what these powers are and how they can be developed to produce the most good for the most people. I know from what Mr. Pollard and the others say that Katie can at least do some amazing things. Katie stood there, neither denying or admitting to anything. She still wasn't sure that she trusted Mr. C any more than Mrs. M did. No one else was admitting anything either. Look, Mr. C said, I know that you've all had difficulties adjusting to school and living with ordinary people. Mrs. Michaelmas thought that I should leave you alone to be a normal girl. But, Katie, you're not normal. You're going to have more than the usual number of problems growing up, and I think we can help you with them. It was true, Katie thought. She had always had more problems than most kids. Katie was intrigued at the thought that it might be possible to use her abilities openly. It would be nice not to have to watch her step every minute the way she had been trying to do. Are there other kids at your school? she asked. Like us? Yes, he told her. There are seventeen now. We think that there will be more, but it's so hard to find them. They don't know about us, or they don't understand, and they try not to be found. Did their mothers all take that drug before they were born? Carrie asked. No. Only the mothers of you four handled that drug as far as we know. Some of the others were born to mothers who worked with other substances, and some of them are still a mystery to us. We don't know why these children have talents. It's one of the things we're trying to find out. Dale spoke up then. We wouldn't be considered freaks at your school, would we? We wouldn't have to remember not to do things that are natural to us, Carrie added, so that people don't think we're crazy. Sometimes people think that I'm crazy or a witch. She sounded a bit wistful. I promise you, Mr. C said, at our school, no one would consider you a witch or a freak. Eric cleared his throat then. And what is it that you want of Katie and us? Why are you investigating? Because, Mr. C said, I would like very much for you to all come and live at our school. You'd like it there, I think. He smiled, 
But none of the children smiled back. Not yet. Try as she might, Katie couldn't read anything in his mind, and she couldn't tell how sincere he was. Did he really want to help them? Or, in some way she didn't understand, help himself? She didn't quite see what he would do for himself, but she was still getting used to the idea that he didn't want to put her in jail. Is there a wall around your school? she asked. A wall? No, there's a fence, an ordinary fence, because the school is on a large estate, and we have our own farm animals that need to be kept in. It's really pretty. But it's not here? It's a long ways away? she asked. Mr. Sm C. smoothed down his hair. It's about 300 miles away, he said. But you'd be with other kids like you, kids that would accept you the way you are. It was Dale that had the next question. Are they really like us? Do they have silver eyes, too? Well, no, Mr. C. told them. Actually, only you four have silver eyes. Of all the children we've discovered so far. We might find others, though. Katie looked at her mother. Monica had been so happy to see her. Katie didn't doubt that she had been worried. Now, Monica gave her a little smile, and it made something feel funny in Katie's stomach. I do want to know the other kids, Katie said. But if we're all kept apart in a special school, won't we still be freaks? People know that the kids at your school are different, right? Won't they still be afraid of us? There was a silence, and Monica reached for Katie's hand. Katie's right, she said. Children, at least young children, need to have a normal family life, right? Even if they are special? They need to know their parents and brothers and sisters, don't they? And they need to be able to relate to other people, the people they'll eventually have to live and work with, unless they're going to be isolated forever, and that's not what we want, is it? They would feel more at home in a school for kids like themselves, Mr. Casey then said, wouldn't they? I know that Dale doesn't fit into his school very well. It's hard for him to make friends among ordinary kids, and I have to admit, it's been uncomfortable for us, having a kid who's smart and different from everyone else's kids. We have to keep pretending to our friends that he's not different. Mrs. Michaelmas is my friend, Katie said then. Even if she doesn't understand what I do or how I do it. And Jackson Jones is my friend too. He doesn't have special powers either, but he helped me. Maybe it would be better to learn to live with all the regular people? Can't we do that and go to the school too? Just part time? Not living there all the time? The school is a long way from here, Katie, Mr. C told her gently. Well, there are four of us here, Eric said. He shoved his glasses back up on his nose without touching them, just the way Katie was used to doing it. Why can't we live at home and have our own school? like an extension school, the way colleges do. Mrs. Casey gave a nervous laugh. Yes, why not? We could tell people that our children were in a special school without telling them how it was special. Let's face it, the public in general is afraid of anyone that's different. Maybe the kids can handle it when they're grown up, but right now they can't, can they? Why can't we tell everyone that they're in a school for really bright children. Even being in a school for slow learners would be easier to understand than the truth, Mrs. Lamont told everyone. Why can't they have a special school here? I mean, they could go to regular school during the week, like other kids, and then maybe on Saturdays they could have classes the way they do for gifted children, where they learn Russian or things like that. Our kids could learn, well whatever they'd be learning at your school. Carrie spoke up then. I think Mr. C's school, I think maybe they want to study us, like bugs. We, we do want to know more about you, Mr. C admitted, but not like bugs, Carrie. 
you're special people and you can probably be important leaders or do things that will benefit mankind if you want to. We think we can help you do that and also help you learn to be happy in a world that's mostly filled with people that might have to be taught how to accept your differences. Katie felt Monica's fingers tighten on her hand. I think Eric's right, Monica said, and Fern's idea is good, too. I can see that Katie does need to be with other children like herself, but I think she needs to learn how to be with ordinary kids, too. And, well, we haven't lived together for the last six years, and we're just beginning to get used to each other again. I would like to keep Katie at home, at least for a few more years, until she's more grown up, although... I'll leave it up to her, whether she wants to stay with me or go to your school. Well, I guess we're going to have to talk about this a little bit, Mr. Katie said. It's too important to make a decision without consideration. And of course, the kids will have a big say in it, too. I think they should have a chance to get acquainted with each other, and maybe we could all visit your school before we decide. Katie could see that Mr. C was disappointed that they didn't all agree to do what he wanted to at once. The idea of living in a place with a lot of kids like her did make her sort of excited, but it was kind of scary, too. She looked at the others and didn't need to be a mind reader to know that they all felt the same way about it. Carrie's father cleared his throat and asked, And what does the school cost? I mean, we're not rich people. We can't afford private school. All the grown-ups started talking at once, but Katie didn't listen to them. She looked at the other silver-eyed children, and by mutual consent, without any of them saying a word, they moved towards the door that led to the deck. Dale slid the doors closed on the noisy voices and joined the others at the railing, looking at the swimming pool. They hadn't had a chance to talk to each other very much, but somehow they didn't need to. Considering they were all strangers, Katie felt remarkably comfortable with them. Could you tell? she asked Dale. Could you read Mr. C's mind? Is he on the level, or is it like Carrie said, they want to study us like a bug? It's a little of both, I think, Dale said. I mean, I think he's sincere in saying that he wants what's best for us and everyone. I don't know if we'd always agree with him, though, in that what he wants is what we want. Unexpectedly, he grinned. I think it might not be too hard to pretend that we were bugs under a microscope and that we didn't understand the things he wanted of us. Things would be easier, Eric told them with four of us than each of us on the, our own. Nobody responded to that. They didn't need to. They stood there in a row with their hands on the railing and saw Mr. Pollard come out of the building with a towel and some suntan lotion in his paper. Miss Katzenberger was already there in her blue bikini and he walked up and said something to her. Miss Kay shook her head then Mr. P put a hand on her arm, and Miss K shook it off, as if she were irritated. At that moment, Lobo started across the pool area. He didn't want to drink from the pool. The chlorine made it taste bad. Katie guessed he was just taking a shortcut. Then suddenly, from the corner where the door opened into the area near the alley, a familiar figure appeared. A big Airedale sniffing around and lifting his head. Oh, man, that's Toby. He must have followed me, Eric muttered, and started to go towards the stairs. Where'd that mutt come from, Mr. Pollard said. Get out of here. Shoo! Toby didn't pay any attention to Mr. P. He took one look at Lobo and barked, a deep bark that sent Lobo flying. The next thing the watchers saw was Mr. P., kicking and yelling as the animals ran past him. His suntan lotion sailed into the pool, and so did his paper, and his towel wrapped itself around his head and face so that he staggered and went backward into the pool, shoes and all. 
When he came up sputtering and choking and ripping away the towel, Miss Kay laughed. Toby and Lobo had disappeared, but Katie wasn't worried about Lobo. He could look out for himself. Mr. P looked up and saw the four children above him on the deck. His face got red, and so did his bald spot. He made a grab for the pages of the paper before the sheets sank and threw the mess onto the tiles in front of Miss Kay. She was still laughing. There are four of them now, he said, his voice carrying up to the silent watchers. There should be a law against kids like that. You're not blaming them for your fall into the pool, are you? Miss Kay asked. They weren't anywhere near you. You know, Mr. Pollard, if that little girl bothers you so much, you should maybe consider moving. I have a friend who's looking for an apartment. The one that you have would suit her just fine. Mr. P. didn't answer. He started to climb out of the water, and as if the soaked newspaper had a life of its own, it rose from the tiles and plastered itself against his chest and face. Katie hadn't done anything. She wasn't sure which of the others did. She simply waited to see what would happen, and in a way she almost felt a bit sorry for Mr. P. He doesn't pay the paper boy, Katie told the others. He hates cats and dogs, Eric said. He uses fake money in vending machines, Dale murmured. And he uses nasty language, Carrie observed. Just then, Mr. P. reached for the bottle of suntan lotion. As his fingers began to close around it, it spurted away and sailed across the pool. With a curse, Mr. P. plunged after it, and Miss K. laughed again. Up above, on the deck, Katie turned her head to look at Carrie, whose mouth widened in a secretive smile. Whether we go off to school or stay here at home, we're going to have a lot of fun together, came the thought. Yes, Katie thought back. And then they were all smiling, the same secret smile touching all four pairs of silver eyes in the same way. Whatever happened now, Katie thought, just for herself, she didn't believe she was ever going to be lonesome again. And when she looked at Carrie and Dave, or Dale and Eric, she knew they were all thinking the same thing. And that is how this book ends. And unfortunately, I looked for not the very first time, but I did look again before I started this. There's no sequel. Which, it's, it's one of those good and bad things. Like, it, it leaves you to imagine how things went as maybe Katie and the others grew up or all of that but darn it I do want a sequel I also think this would make a really fun just like Netflix movie or kind of like when I was a kid the after school specials that they had I don't know it, it was a wonderful book when I was about the same age as Katie here and it always made me happy kind of the way peanuts make chipmunks happy. <laughs> Even if they have trouble getting it into their mouth. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this book. I'm not sure what we'll read. We will be reading tomorrow something. Um, I might do just another short, fun one. Or I was thinking about it, other books that I was reading when I was, you know, a kid. Because, I mean, I have gone back and read, like, the Harry Potter books, but I was already a mom when those came out, so I can't exactly say that they were a book I loved as a kid. They are good, despite anything, any issues with the author still don't discount the fact that the books were good. I, I try not to get too much into the political leanings of various authors. I mean, sometimes you can't help it, but it still doesn't... It's like, I, I have thought about maybe doing the um, 
the Chronicles of Narnia, like the whole series. And I love those books, but I don't necessarily align with C.S. Lewis and, you know, the different symbolism that he put in the books. I just enjoyed them as books. Which is why I don't do, like, the whole booktube the way people do, breaking it down and going into the psychological. No, I, I just like a good story. If a story is good, it makes me happy. Anyway, um, I really hope you enjoyed this book. It, it is left a bit open-ended, and like I said, I, I've looked so many times over the years for a sequel, and there's never been one, which, oh well. Anyway, um, thank you again. I will be back tomorrow with another book. I'm not sure what it's going to be yet. If you're watching the, um, the Dragon Riders of Pern books that I do in the evenings, um, I might put into, a, into there what I'm going to do next, or maybe I'll just insert this as a comment below this video, just so you know what's coming next. And other than that, I hope you guys have a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow.